Uh, listen, there's no food like church picnic food. That's some of the best food in the world. So invite your friends to that as well. We're going to have all kinds of activities. I just bought a bunch of throwing axes. I can't wait to pull those out. We're going to have fun. So uh, please invite your friends. Uh, uh, August 28th, 11 to 1, over at uh, Palmer Lake. All right, this, this morning we are winding down our series, our summer series, on great women of the Bible. And we're going to end with two uh, women that are related uh, to each other in Scripture. Today we're going to talk about a woman named Hannah. And next week we're going to end our series with Mary. Uh, Mary is one of my favorite characters in all Scripture. We're going to study her, learn some things about her. Maybe that uh, we don't know. But Mary and Hannah are paired together in the course of Revelation in Scripture in a very profound way, even though they lived a thousand years apart. And we're going to talk about that more next week. Today we're going to talk about Hannah. Go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 2. I want to encourage you to take notes on your outlines this morning. We're going to begin with Hannah. Hannah's name, the name Hannah in Hebrew is pronounced Hannah, and Hannah means favor or grace, favor or grace. So Hannah means grace. The name Mary or Miriam in Hebrew means beloved. And so in these two women, we see the grace and the love of God. So who's this Hannah uh, character? Well, Hannah was a great woman of God. She loved the Lord. She was very devoted to the Lord. And she was married to a good man. His name was, was Elkanah. And her heart's desire was to have a baby. Okay, she really wanted to be a mother. However, she was unable to conceive. She and her husband, Elkanah, tried and tried, but they just could not get pregnant, and this absolutely devastated Hannah. Many years ago, uh, when Judy and I were younger in our marriage, uh, we've been married for 32 years, over three decades, but when we were newly married in those early years, we wanted to have children, and we had a difficult time getting pregnant. And I want to say, you know, I'll block some of the, that out because it's so painful, but we had a long period, you know, like, like over a year, where we really tried to uh, get pregnant, and we could not get pregnant, and that was very discouraging. Uh, we had to get medical help. That was a little humiliating. Uh, I can remember thinking, what's wrong with me? Is there something wrong with me as a man? Uh, but, and that was painful, but uh, Judy uh, had much more pain than I did. You could say that uh, this condition, this inability to get pregnant, attacked the very core of Judy's femininity. And it was agonizing to her. And finally, after medical attention, we got some help. We got pregnant with our first child, Olivia. And uh, the floodgates opened after that. And we went on to have three more kids. But that was a very, very difficult season. And I've seen this with many women over the years. I've been in ministry for uh, well over 30 years. And... I've noticed that, and all pastors know this, that uh, perhaps the most painful Sunday of, of the year is Mother's Day. Uh, women who have not been able to have a baby find Mother's Day very difficult. They often skip church on Mother's Day, and I understand why. Very painful to them. Well, Hannah was living with this. She was barren. And not only did this break her heart, but there was a stigma attached to being barren in her culture. People assumed that if you weren't able to have a child as a woman, there was a sin in your life. Uh, you were cursed of God. Uh, there must be something that Hannah's doing 
that is causing this condition. God is not happy with her. That was a commonly held belief. For example, we see Rachel struggling with, the, with this. Rachel, the great matriarch, found, uh, she's found in Genesis chapter 30. Um, and she get, eventually gets pregnant and gives birth to the great leader Joseph. But when she gets pregnant, she says this in Genesis chapter 30. She says, God has taken away my disgrace. So in this culture, if a woman couldn't get pregnant... It was disgraceful. And think of the irony here. Hannah's name literally means grace, and yet she is in this situation, this state of disgrace, this state of no grace, and it was shameful. And so she had to deal with the stigma of this and people talking about her. Have you ever had people talk about you? And spread false rumors about you and gossip about you. Hannah lived this every day. People saying, you know, Hannah must have done something wrong. You know, maybe she had an affair on her husband. Or, you know, maybe she's been stealing money from somewhere. Maybe she did something that, you know, she dishonored God in some way. I wonder what she did. Why can't she get pregnant? And so it was assumed that Hannah was in a state of wickedness. She had to deal with that. And then to add to it, there was a woman in her life that took pleasure. She was jealous of Hannah, and she took pleasure in the fact that Hannah couldn't have a a baby, and she humiliated her. She mocked her. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, this woman whose name is Penina... I find her name even annoying. This is an evil woman, Panina. She is described as provoking Hannah endlessly. By the way, if your name's Panina, no offense. I'm sorry, but it got bad for Hannah. And the, the text says that, it, that she was so devastated by this that she actually became anorexic. She stopped eating. And she was extremely depressed, and her countenance fell. Uh, she, she began to go from what you would assume was a beautiful woman to this affecting her health and her appearance. And I, I think of Hannah as sort of a real-life Cinderella. She's in the attic. She's locked in the attic, and she is mocked constantly like the stepsisters with Cinderella. So how does Hannah handled this. Well, Hannah fervently takes her pain to God. And she begins to go to her church, the temple, and she spends long days at the temple and she falls on her knees before God and she weeps before Him. And on one particular day, she's at her church, she's weeping, she hasn't been eating, she looks like a skeleton. Her face is all gaunt. Her hair is not done. She probably hasn't taken a bath. She looks terrible as she's just crying. And she's so exhausted that she can't even get the words out. So her lips are moving as she prays silently. And her pastor happens to notice her. Her pastor was a priest by the name of Eli. Eli walks by. He sees this woman. And she looks so bad, he assumes that she's drunk. He thinks this woman is a, an alcoholic who stumbled into church while she was drunk. That's happened to me a couple of times as a pastor. I've had people stumble into church while they were high or drunk. And for me, uh, yes, it's been irritating if they disrupt the service, but I have a level of compassion for them because I'm thinking, man, it must be bad if you're showing up at church drunk well Eli gets irritated the priest and he rebukes Hannah and he says why why are you at church why are you in the temple drunk why don't you lay off the bottle of wine and he rebukes her and Hannah looks over at him and she says pastor I'm not drunk I'm just grieving I'm devastated I can't have a baby And I'm asking the Lord to help me. 
and I'm just weeping before God. You can read all about this in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1. And Eli realizes he's mistaken. He has compassion on her and he blesses her. Okay? So her pastor, her priest, blesses her. And by the way, we as evangelicals don't think about this much, but there's a theology of blessing in Scripture. And there is power in godly people blessing you. When you're going through a hard time, there's nothing wrong with seeking out a holy person and asking for their blessing. Okay, so Eli blesses her and something happens. The next morning, guess what happens? She gets pregnant. And God gives her a son. And the Bible says that God remembered her and opens up her womb. And that baby, that son, becomes the great prophet prophet Samuel. And we talked about Samuel last week. Samuel Samuel is one of the greatest people that the world has ever seen. Matter of fact, he wrote 1 and 2 Samuel. So he's writing about his own mother when we read this uh, today. And uh, Samuel's the great prophet that anoints Uh, King David is king of Israel. He also becomes a mentor to King David. And uh, the name Samuel, which Hannah gives him, that name means God hears or God has heard me. So if you have have any friends whose name uh, is Sam, um, you can tell them, hey, do you know what your name means? It means God hears. God hears our prayers. And by the way, I, I just have a little kind of side hobby. I like to know what biblical names mean and so I do this with my football team you know I'm a freshman football coach at Palmer Ridge and uh, when the new class comes in I'm learning their names and if I recognize a biblical name you know I'll tell that kid what his name means you know like for example Michael hey hey son do you know you have a biblical name Michael that's a Hebrew name you know what it means it means there's only one God God alone is God. Did you know that? And you're named after the greatest angel in the Bible, the great archangel Michael. And then, you know, I'll kind of reference that throughout the season. Uh, This season, uh, we had a kid named Judah. Uh, He's one of my linebackers. And, uh, you know, I was like, son, what's your name? He said, Judah. I said, you know you have a biblical name? "Uh Uh-uh, coach. Or you know what your name means? "Uh Uh-uh. I go, have you ever heard of the lion of Judah? Oh, I don't know. I'm like, well, Judah was one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And there's a man that is called the Lion of Judah. And he comes from that line. He comes from the tribe of Judah. And the Lion of Judah is Jesus Christ, the greatest man who ever lived. So for the rest of the season, Judah, I'm going to call you Lion. And Judah's a player. You know, the other day in a drill, we were doing a tackling drill, and he just... Man, he hit that kid so hard, that kid's grandchildren are going to feel it. And I was like, that's a lion right there. That's a football player. Judah, the lion of Judah right there. And so he loves it. Anyway, that's a little way that you can get the Lord into uh, people's lives. But Hannah calls her son Samuel, which means God heard me. And then Sam, or, uh, Hannah, in response to the, the answer prayer of the Lord or the miracle that God gives her, uh, she writes uh, one of the greatest prayers the world has ever seen. Okay, and we're going to study that prayer today. How do I know it's one of the greatest prayers? Well, I know that because the greatest woman that has ever lived quotes this prayer. Who's the greatest woman who ever lived? Mary. The The Roman Catholic Church is right about that. You know, in the rosary, they say, Hail Mary, full of grace, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. That's all scripture, okay? The Bible teaches that Mary is the greatest woman who ever lived. We're not supposed to worship her, we're not supposed to pray to her, but we should honor her as the greatest woman who ever lived. And she's one of my favorite characters in all of history. I can't wait to preach this sermon to you next week week but Mary when she finds out that she's going to be the mother of the savior of the world she breaks out in this prayer and it's called the Magnificat and that prayer is based on the prayer of Hannah that was given a thousand years 
earlier, okay? So we'll see that more next week, but we're going to break down this prayer, and I'm going to show you some surprising things in this prayer. There are three unusual ingredients in the prayer of Hannah that we don't typically think about when we pray. And so I'm going to challenge you to uh, modify your prayers a little bit uh, today. And I think you're going to be blessed by this. The first unlikely ingredient is boasting. Boasting. Did you know that God wants you to brag sometimes? He actually wants you to boast. Take a look at verses 1 through 2. It says, Then Hannah prayed, and she said, My my heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord, my horn is lifted high. Horn is a symbol of strength. She's saying, I have great strength now because of the Lord. And then she says this, My mouth boasts over my enemies. Why are you boasting over your enemies, Hannah? Because or for I delight in your deliverance, Father. There's no one holy. The word holy means set apart, unique. There's nobody set apart like the Lord. There's no one besides you. There's only one God. And there is no rock like our God. Hannah does something that we as Christians think that we're never supposed to do. She brags. Look at the last part of verse 1. She says, my mouth boasts over my enemies. Let me ask you a question. Is she in sin here while she is boasting over her enemies? Is it ever appropriate to brag? Well, believe it or not, there are times When not only is it appropriate, we are commanded to brag in Scripture. We are to brag about God in our prayers. The Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 1, 31. He commands us. He says, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. We're supposed to brag about the Lord. And when you pray, it's okay to brag. It's actually more than okay. It's great when you boast about God. Specifically, brag about how he's delivered you from stuff in your life. Brag about the new life he's given you. Brag about how he's changed you. Brag about how he's delivered you from that terrible relationship or that poor choice that you made or that bad that bad di- uh, business deal that you got yourself entangled in or... Um, even from, listen to me, even from that bad person, there are bad people in the world, and sometimes we get all mixed up with them and attached to them, and God can deliver you from that, and when he delivers you, brag about it in your prayers. Listen, aren't you glad that God has delivered the world from Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden and this latest character, Al Zawari or whatever, however you say his name. Aren't you glad that those guys are gone, that God took them out? Can I get an amen? We should brag about when God does that. Of course we should be thankful for that. So why wouldn't you thank God for delivering you from someone who's hurt you or abused you or broken your heart and betrayed you? Brag about God in your life. Hannah is praising God. And she's praising God for the fact that she doesn't have to listen to this cruel woman, Panina, making fun of her all the time because she can't have a baby, mocking her, provoking her, causing her to have anorexia, stopping her from eating. She doesn't have to deal with all of this chat, chatter of, his, of her own people, saying, you know, what's wrong with Hannah? Boy, she must have sinned big time. Did you hear Hannah can't have a baby? I wonder what she did. She's bragging about the fact that she doesn't have to deal with this chatter, all this talk anymore. She's praising God. She's saying, God won. He won in my life. And I'm winning because of Him. Boast when you pray to God. I want you to think of a situation right now that God has delivered you from. Everybody in this room has been delivered from something. 
You know, maybe it was a, a person that God delivered you from, or a terrible boss, or a really bad company situation, or, or maybe you grew up in an abusive family, and you were beaten every day of your life when you were a kid, and God delivered you from that family. Or maybe it's a bad relationship. You were in this toxic, dependent, degrading relationship. And you cried out to God. And He delivered you from that person. Before I gave my life to Christ, I was in a toxic relationship with a young lady. And I thought I loved her. And in a, in a way, I did love her. I cared about her. But it was a terrible relationship. And we were doing things that were humiliating. And we became addicted to each other. And I was hurting her and she was hurting me. And I could not get out of that relationship. You know, I'd try to break up and then I'd find myself, you know, at midnight calling her up. You know, and she would call me. And it was a terrible, terrible situation for both of us. And then I gave my life to Jesus. And Jesus gave me the strength to break off that relationship and end it. And praise God for that. I, I boast in the Lord for the supernatural strength that He gave me to break that toxic, codependent addiction. And I praise God that uh, He rescued me from her and He rescued her from me. And life got so much better. Think of a situation that God has delivered you from. Now I want you to bow your head. I want us all to bow our heads. And I want you to boast about God silently. I want you to tell him, thank you, Lord, for delivering me from this situation. And spell it out. And then boast about God's power. God, you alone, you're the only one that could have saved me from that. I praise you for that. Boast about God in your life right now. Let's just take a few minutes and do that. Father, I thank you for the deliverance that you've given all of us and that you continue to offer us. We boast in you. You are the Lord God Almighty. And that's not just a title, that's a description. You're the only one who's all-powerful, and you're the only one who, who could have given us that deliverance. We brag about that, and we thank you. And I pray that for the rest of the sermon, we would come more into contact with the living God. I pray this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. Second unusual thing that you see in this prayer is instruction. Instruction. Did you know that it's, op it's appropriate at times and even uh, endorsed or encouraged that when we pray, we're actually teaching people who are hearing the prayer. Let me show you what I mean. Verses 3 through 9, Hannah says this in her magnificent prayer. She says, Do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance. She's speaking to her enemies while she's praying. Okay? And she says, Listen to all you people who are proud and arrogant before God. Don't do that. For the Lord is a God who knows. God knows. And by Him, all of our deeds are weighed. The bows of the warriors are broken. But those who stumbled are armed with strength. Those who were, fu were, were full hire themselves out for food now. But those who were hungry are hungry no more. She who was barren has borne seven children 
But she who has had many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and he makes alive. He brings down to the grave and he raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap or the city dump. He sits them with princesses or princes and he has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. On them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful servants. But the wicked, the wicked, they're going to be silenced in the place of darkness. Now what is Hannah doing in this prayer? Well, she's teaching outstanding theology. She's given a systematic course on a topic that theologians call the sovereignty of God. We talked about it last week. Last week I told you that it's a major theme in Scripture. Sovereignty means God is in control. God is the sovereign. He is the king, the ultimate king. And all of history is moving according to his plan. We don't see it sometimes. But Hannah is saying, trust me, God's in control. And in the end, God will win. He always wins. He has history in the palm of his hand. So we see this theme, this major theme of the Bible again. Hannah says he's the king. It is God who determines the mighty. It's God who determines who's hungry. God who determines who's rich and who's poor. And her point is, those of you who are arrogant before God. You're wealthy right now, you're beautiful, and you think you don't need God. And you think you did all this yourself. I want to warn you, God is the one that gave you the ability to have wealth. You're blessed, and he can take it away at any moment, and he's watching you. You may be poor, Hannah is saying, and you may be barren, And you may be without honor, and you may be without power, but if you're close to the Lord, you are blessed, and it's just a matter of time before you will have victory. However, if you're rich, and you have 20 kids, and you're famous, and you're powerful, if you're a Cardassian, or you got the biggest podcast in the world, you're Joe Rogan, or you're Tom Brady, you're the most honored athlete in the world. Or Lord help you, you're a real housewife of Beverly Hills. And you think you're all that. And you think you got there without God. And if you mock God and you make fun of God and you make fun of Jesus and you make fun of God's people, Hannah is saying, your day is coming. God sees you. And you will give an account. And you will be cursed of the Lord if you don't get your act together before him. Your time is coming because God is the king. He is the sovereign. And you're nothing compared to him. You think you're something? You're nothing compared to God. That's what Hannah is saying to the prideful. She's saying that. She's screaming that today in our country, which is walking away from God and is constantly mocking God. There will be a day where you're going to have to deal with that. You're going to have a come-to-Jesus moment. It will happen. Pastor Greg Laurie once said something about Voltaire. How many of you have heard of Voltaire? Okay, Voltaire is a famous philosopher, French philosopher from the 1700s. He was very famous during his day. He was a very wealthy, highly respected atheist. Voltaire, even to this day, is most famous for, probably most famous for, the idea of the separation of church and state, which I actually agree with, but I don't agree with, it, with, that, with that because of Voltaire's reasons. Voltaire hated Christianity. He didn't believe there was a God. He believed that Christianity was a plague on the planet. He wanted it destroyed. He wanted our faith destroyed. He hated Jesus. 
And he had a huge intellect. And he actually believed that by his philosophical writings and his speaking and his influence, that he alone could destroy our faith. Let me me read to you a direct quote from Voltaire. This is what he said about Jesus. He said, curse that wretch. He referred to Jesus as a wretch or a terrible person. Okay, Curse that wretch. In 20 years, Christianity will be no more. My single hand will destroy the edifice it took 12 apostles to rear. So Voltaire, this rich, influential man, this high intellect, he predicts that by his teachings, by his writings, he alone will destroy Christianity within 20 years of his lifetime by the strength of his arguments against our faith. However, what actually happens? Well, on his deathbed, Voltaire cries out to his doctor. He's in pain, and he is faced with the specter of eternity. All of a sudden, reality hits him. The reality of the supernatural world. He's looking at the corridors of his future after death. And this is what he says. All of a sudden, he believes in God. And he says this, I'm abandoned by God and by man. And he looks to his doctor and he says, I will give you half of what I'm worth if you will give me six months, just six more months to live. And listen to this, then I shall go to hell and you will go with me. And then he says this, he cries out, he goes, oh Christ, oh Jesus Christ. Famous last words, he calls on the name of the God that he predicted to kill within his lifetime. Now listen to this. Just 50 years after his death, the Geneva Bible Society prints Bibles. And one of the first times that mass printing was available to the world, they start printing Bibles to give to regular people like you and me so that we can have the Word of God. Guess where they print the Bibles? 50 years later, the Geneva Bible Society acquires Voltaire's estate and uses his printing press to print Bibles. Hundreds, thousands of Bibles that were spread throughout the world and spread the faith. I don't believe that's a coincidence. I believe God was speaking through that. I believe God was saying, I'm watching and I always win. And if you mock me, there will be a price. And if you mock my people, there will be a price. That's what Hannah is teaching her enemies. Listen, sometimes when we pray, it's okay to teach. I think a really good application of this is, you know, let's say you have somebody in your life that is antagonistic toward our faith. Maybe they're an atheist. Uh, I've noticed this. I... In my ministry and throughout my life, it is extremely rare. I I can only think of one time where somebody actually told me that I couldn't pray for them. So if you got a friend, family member who doesn't know the Lord, they're going to go through pain in life. Something's going to happen. And instead of trying to browbeat them into, into the kingdom, wait till something bad happens to them. Ask the Lord to give you an approachable spirit. Go to them and say, Would you mind if I pray for you? I have an atheist uh, friend in my life. I love him. And uh, he doesn't like me talking to him about Jesus. But he likes it when I pray. And he'll listen for when when I pray. And I can teach him stuff while I'm praying. So let me give you an example. Let's say you have a friend named Jim. Jim's going, Jim just found out he had cancer. He's an atheist. Jim, I know you don't believe in God, but I do. Let me have faith for you. Would you mind if I prayed for you? Okay, go ahead and pray for me. You place your hand on Jim's shoulder or in the small of his back. You say, oh, Lord God, you love Jim. And he doesn't know you. But, Lord, you, uh, Father, you sent your son, Jesus, to live a perfect life and become one of us. And he took all of his perfection And he put it on the cross and he gave us credit for it. 
and he paid for all of our sins, all of our mistakes, all of Jim's mistakes. And then he rose from the gra- grave and he proved that he was God and that he could take that on. And so I want to thank you that, Lord, you died for Jim's sins. And I want to pray that the resurrection power that you used to rise from the grave, I pray that you would touch Jim with that right now. I pray that you would heal his cancer. I pray that you would let him know that you're real. Give him an overwhelming sense of your love and your presence. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And while you're doing it, I've done that many times with people that had nominal or no faith at all. And what am I doing? What are you doing? You're teaching the gospel while you're praying. It's a great way to pray. It's a great tool, and God will use it. All right, third thing that Hannah does that you wouldn't expect in a prayer is prophecy. Prophecy. So take a look at verses 9 through 10, the end of verse 9. She says this, It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to His King and exalt the horn of His anointed. What in the world is Hannah talking about here? Well, she's giving a prophecy. I think that what's happened here is that as Hannah is praying, God actually gives her a vision of the future, and she looks through the passages of time into the future and uh, thousands of years ahead. And she sees Jesus, and she sees the second coming of Christ. Okay, so let's, let's look at the, the passage again. She says in verse uh, 10... She says, the Most High will thunder from heaven, and the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. That's going to happen at the second coming. I don't know if you've heard, but Jesus is coming back. He came the first time as the Lamb who would sacrifice His life for the sins of the world. The second time He comes, He will come as the Lion, the most supreme court judge, and He will judge the world. And when He comes... It will sound like thunder. The trumpet of God will sound, and the entire world will see this spectacle. And God will come back and judge the ends of the earth. Hannah is seeing this in real time as she prays. Tremendous. She also sees the Messiah being born a thousand years later from the prayer. The word anointed that she uses. She says, he will give strength to his king. She's talking about God the Father. And she says, God the Father will exalt the horn, the strength of his anointed. The word anointed there is Messiah. She's talking about Jesus. She sees him while she is praying. And she's saying he's coming back. There's going to be an end to time. And all of you people who don't take God seriously, you're going to take God seriously then. And by the way, just as a pastor, I'm going to challenge you guys. I've noticed during COVID, we're not taking God seriously. It's like God is a movie we go to every now and then. We show up to church every now and then when we feel like it. Like we're going to a nice restaurant. God deserves better than that. He is your creator. He is the king of the universe. And every single blessing in your life, Everything that's good in your life is a gift from Him. And He deserves to be worshipped. That's an amen moment. Can I get an amen? So get serious about your walk with God. Every now and then, I just got to go all Cajun pastor on you. Go Baptist on your rear ends. Get serious about God. Because He's serious about you. And then sometimes when you pray... You need to give a prophecy. I'm going to go a little charismatic on you here, but God will speak to you and through you in real time about the issues of your life. You have the Lord God Almighty who's died on a cross for you. And He offers you intimacy. He offers to talk to you about your issues and my issues. And I'm going to be honest with you, I neglect Him. 
I'm not coming at you from a place of judgment. I'm yelling at myself as much as I'm yelling at you. I'm sorry I'm yelling. But we neglect him. I mean, the, the reality is most Christians really don't pray. We don't pray. I mean, let's be honest. When was the last time you spent an hour in prayer? Seriously. I bet if I had us raise our hands, none of us have in the last two years spent one hour in prayer. And God's sitting there waiting. And so we go about our lives, and we got this issue or that issue, and we're just acting like he's not there, and we're trying to handle our problems in our own strength. Hannah is emphatically saying, she says this, it's not by our strength that we succeed. And so she's, she's begging us, take God seriously in your life. Do you realize the resource that you're leaving on the table? Pray to God about the issues in your life. Go to him and say, God, I've got a daughter right now that, that's experimenting with drugs and, and she's dating boys that are bad for her and I don't know what to do. You know, it, this terrifies me. Please, I request of you an answer for this. And seek him. All right, let's lighten this moment up a little bit. I'm going to show my age. But how many of you on your phone have a playlist or a couple of playlists on your phone? How many, how many of you? Okay, most of you. So I've got playlists on my phone, and I have a wide variety of musical preferences. You know, I like uh, worship music. I especially like Irish and African-American worship, okay? So I like to listen to that on my playlist. I also like country music. I like Montgomery, Gent- G- Montgomery Gentry, you know. Where I come from, anybody know that song? Where I come from, there's a line in that song. Where I come from, there's a preacher man in a cowboy shirt. I'm in that song. I wear cowboy shirts. So I love that song. I like Johnny Cash, you know. I'm stuck in Folsom prison, watching time go by. You know, I love Johnny Cash. And I like uh, 70s rock. I like... Sweet home Alabama. You know, I love those songs, you know, and I listen to them while I'm barbecuing. But there was a time when there was no internet and there were no music apps like Amazon Music and Pandora and all that stuff. There was a time when you had to work for your playlist. How many, can I get an amen from some of you? You guys remember making mixtapes? You remember the era of mixtapes? Uh, my buddy Jim Brown and I, he was my best friend in uh, junior high, we used to make mix, mixtapes together. And here's how it went. Jim had the latest technology. He had a, uh, a, a uh, clock radio that had a cassette player on top of it. You remember those? And so here's the deal. On, on Friday nights, we would get a frozen pizza, Tony's Pizza. We would get like a two-liter bottle of Coca-Cola and at about 9 o'clock, there was a station. It was the top station in Lake Charles, Louisiana. It was called KLOU, KLOU. And at 9 o'clock, they had a guy on, and his name was the Ugly Jock. He was the disc, jay, disc jockey, and his title was the Ugly Jock. And you know why he called himself the Ugly Jock? Because he was ugly. I saw him one time. This dude was ugly. He fell out of an ugly, ugly tree and hit every branch on the way down. He was an ugly dude. But he leveraged that. And he called himself the Ugly Jock. And you could call in to KLOU and you could request a song. And so we would put a cassette tape. They had these things, young people, called cassette tapes. And you would put it into the top of the uh, clock radio. And you would call the Ugly Jock. And somebody would answer. It wasn't the Ugly Jock. Somebody would answer. And I would say something like, Hi, this is Rusty Hayes. I want to request Peaches and Herb Reunited right? And they would go, okay, Rusty, we're going to try to get Peaches and Herb on for you. And then Jim and I would stick by that clock radio and listen to KLOU for two hours, waiting for our requested song to come on, right? And then all of a sudden, the ugly jock, jock would come on and he'd go, and this next, next song is from my man, Rusty Hayes. Peaches and Herb, reunited. I hope you get reunited with a Rusty. And, and we were like, oh my gosh. And we would press record and then 
reunited and it feels so good. You know, and we would record that, and then we would stop it, and then Jim would call. And Jim would, would call the KLOU, and he would go, hey, this is Jim Brown. Uh, could you play the BG, Staying Alive? You know, we want to hear them staying alive. And, and they would say, okay, we'll try to play the Bee Gees for you. And we would wait another two hours. We'd do this all night. And then two hours later, you know, Ugly Jack would come up. Hey, this is for my man, Jim Brown, you know. I hope you're staying alive, Jim. And, ha, 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 you know, and we would press the button, you know. And we would put some work into these stinking mixtapes. And then we'd get a piece of tape when it was over. And we would put romance mixtape, you know. And we would bring it to the next party that parents were out of town and we would play Spin the Bottle. Hallelujah. But anyway, we would do that. We'd make these mixtapes. Why am I telling you all this? Some of y'all reliving your childhood. I can see it right now. Spin the Bottle. Some of your kids are going, what is that? But anyway, why am I bringing that up? Well, God's kind of like that in a weird way. So here's, here's what I mean. You get fervent about prayer. Put some time in a prayer. I get serious about it. Do more than thanks for this cheeseburger, God, in your life. And you pray to God, and you say to him, God, I, I noticed a lump on myself the other day. Lord, I noticed this lump. And I'm really scared. I'm really scared. I don't want to go to the doctor. I'm afraid what the doctor's going to say. I got kids. I can't die right now. I request of you wisdom. Or Lord, I'm getting older. And I think I'm losing my memory. The other day I forgot what my grandson's name was. And I couldn't, I couldn't remember. It took me five minutes before it dropped down. I don't know what to do. I feel like I'm losing myself. I'm terrified. This, this really scares me. Please give me, I request of you, please give me wisdom. Or Lord, I just lost my job. And my house cost $500,000, and that's the cheapest house we could find around here. And my mortgage is $3,000 a month, and I'm not going to get a paycheck. I don't know what to do. Please give me wisdom. I request wisdom from you. And you do that daily. And you spend time seeking out your king. Did I mention he's your king? And show him respect. And get serious about your walk with God and stop playing around. Lean into him. Give him the worship that he is worthy of. And he will speak to you. He may just give you a prophecy. He gave me a prophecy about this church. Judy and I were away on a spiritual retreat, and just a retreat to relax. We went to Arizona. We were staying with some friends at a friend's place in Arizona. I was on staff at New Life Church. I get a call from Pastor Brady at New Life. He says, Rusty, the plans we had for you for COVID, we're not going to be able to, or the plans we had for you, we're not going to be able to do because of COVID. But we've talked about it, and we believe that you are a senior pastor. You're supposed to be a senior pastor of a church, so here's what we're prepared to do. We want you, or we're prepared to uh, provide for you a salary while you start a brand new church. And we'll give you your first building for free. We'll let you use one of our uh, buildings for free, and I'll be your first overseer. I'll be on your board. And he, and he said something at the end. He goes, you'll be fine. And I'm like, he's, while he's talking, I'm thinking, wait a minute. We're in the middle of COVID. I'm in my mid-50s, and we're going to start a church? I mean, Pastor Brady, I love you, but have you lost your mind? And we prayed about it, and we knew God was telling us to do it. 
But in particular, that last sentence he said, you'll be fine, was a prophecy from God. And look at what's happened. We have one of the fastest growing churches in Colorado Springs. And we're fine. God has provided for us. He will speak to you as you listen to him. Take advantage of what God is offering you. And don't take him for granted. Let me pray for you. Father, I want to thank you for Hannah, for her example. There are times when we're just like her. We're devastated by something. It even affects our health, like Hannah. She became anorexic. People look at us and think, what's wrong? Life can be that painful at times. And and everybody in this room walked in here with something that scares them. Everybody has something. We have no idea what people are dealing with. I have stuff that scare me. It terrifies me sometimes. But Lord, you are offering to give us wisdom to... You're not the ugly jock. But you're there and you hear our requests. And you have messages for us. You have ways you want to talk to us. There are people that you will send to us. There, were impre- there are impressions that you will give us. Sometimes a passage will jump right out of the Bible. And we'll know that you're talking to us. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a privilege it is to carry all of our burdens to you. I pray that we would grow in our relationship in this. We as Americans, we're a practical people. We're a secular people by nature. We basically are, we're kind of, we act like atheists for much of our lives. We think it all depends on us, but it doesn't. So help us learn from Hannah. And I pray for every person in here or who is listening online that you would give every person a prophecy that would encourage them and they would know it's from you and that they would know that you're the king and that they are your daughter, they are your son. And now, Lord, as we take our offering, I pray that it would be pleasing in your sight. Uh, I pray that you would provide for the needs of this ministry, for the work of your word, and I pray that you would be pleased with what you see from us as we give to you. I love you. I pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Thanks for being with us today. If you would like to partner with us in this ministry and give, you can do so at therenovationchurch.org.